reading of God's holy word, a song of ascent. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my health come? My health comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is a reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Now, in this psalm, you see the little introductory title here. It says, A Song of Ascents, which means, as you know, ascent means going up, going up. So when Israelites were making their pilgrimage to the temple in the city of Jerusalem to worship God and to celebrate the festivals of the Lord, this psalm was one of the songs that they sing on their journey. They said they are going up to the house of God. You probably find that expression a lot in the Bible, going up to the house of God. Um, because it's a worship place. But at the same time, literally, the temple and the city of Jerusalem was physically on a hill, on a higher ground than all the surrounding. So on that journey to the temple, the Psalter lifted up his eyes and see and asked this question in this song. I lift up my eyes to the hill, from where does my help come? Where does my help come? When I was little, when I was in dark place, or when I was little scared, I remember that I used to sing hymns, like in the Korean hymns I learned at church. And in a little childish and foolish mind, I thought if I sing hymns to God, then God will be near to me, God will care for me more and protect me more. I mean... God does protect me, not because I was singing him to God, but because he's my father. Not because, oh, you're singing song to me, so I will do No, obviously not. I mean, so if I don't sing hymns to the Lord, then he does less protection and care for me? No. Yet, at the same time, it encouraged my heart to have confidence in God's care to have confidence in God's grace and be mindful of His goodness towards me as I sing those songs. Oh, that's right. The Lord is. And probably in the same manner as these people were making their pilgrimage to the temple of Jerusalem, even passing through some dangerous areas, they were singing this song on their journey and they can be mindful of God's care and grace. This psalm was intended to instill the confidence and peace in the hearts of those people on their journey. Yet at the same time, he also taught them a lesson that in the same manner, God will care for you in your journey of life, in the believer's journey of life, in our pilgrimage to the city of God there above. That God will care for you. Believe that. So teaching them. Three things I'm going to point out to you. And these three things will not be something, wow, Pastor Billy, I never heard that. I did not know. It's something you already know, something obvious, something you already learned before. And But I want you to be mindful of it and have confidence in this truth. Number one, the Lord is my helper. That's what this psalm says. The Lord is my helper. We search for help. We need help. We need help more than we realize. None of us are exception to that, and none of us can say, oh, no, I don't need anybody's help. I don't need any help. I can live by myself without anyone's help. Nobody can say that. I mean, no matter how strong you are, how smart you are, how healthy or powerful, rich you are, we all need help. And especially when I do ministry, I mean, I realize them more than anything. Like, I need help. I cannot do it by myself. We all need help. We seek for help in life because we are not self-sufficient beings. From the beginning, I mean, 
even before the fall, even before Adam sinned and all this brokenness that happened, even before that, we were originally human beings were created in a way as a finite being who need help. That's why when God created Adam, and the first thing about Adam, not only he's good, and he says, in that condition, before the fall, he says, it is not good for a man to be alone, and I will create a suitable helper for him. Even before the fall, men needed help. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, they need helpers. We all do. But the ultimate help of a man, human being, is not another human being, not another finite being. Yes, they are helpful. You are helpful. I am helpful. We are. But not another fallen, finite human being. The Psalter seeks for a greater helper, greater than my spouse, greater than my family or friend. Verse 2, he says, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, and you know that stands for Yahweh, the name of God behind the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. And you see in this psalm, capital L-O-R-D, Lord, 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 Yahweh, 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 being repeated. Yahweh, who made the heaven and earth, is my help. Now think about the implication of that statement. And you may be very familiar with this psalm in this verse, but... Take it to your heart once again. My help is a creator of all things, meaning he exists before the heaven and earth. That's what it means that he was there and he made the heaven and earth for he existed before the heaven and earth and all that is in it, all that you can see exists before he was there. My God is the eternal God. We are the one who need things in this world, in heaven and earth. God was there. He exists before all these things exist. He does not need any of this. He's a self-sufficient being. He's an independent being. He does not need anything. We are the one who needs Things in this world, not him. My help comes from the self-sufficient one who needs nothing. I am the one who needs his help. He does not need my help. There is never a moment for God to say to you, I need your help. Can you please help me? No, never. Now think about that. This is a song of a psalter. This psalter created, made this song, write, wrote this song and singing. But at the same time, we believe and we know this is God's inspired, infallible, irreverent word of God. This is God's message to you. This is not just a song. This is God's word to you. And he reminds you. And he speaks to you this day for, through this psalm that I will be your helper. I will be your helper. As for me, help. God who provided Adam with Eve to be a helper and Eve to Adam and he provided your friends, your family, your spouse and on and on the people in your life. God did it. Those people who are helping you in your life, God provided those people to be the helpers in your life. However, though they are all from the Lord, He himself declares to be your ultimate help. Did you hear that? Lift up your eyes and see and call upon him. God, the uncreated one, eternal one, unchanging one, the one who is same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change your mind based on your acts. His goodness does not depend on you. He's a self-sufficient one. He's the infinite one. The Yahweh Lord Almighty is your helper. And he reminds you, I will help you. Nothing is beyond my power. Nothing is beyond my rule. Nothing is beyond my power. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord says in this way through that mouth of Paul, Now to him, 
who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And we say, Amen to that. He can do far more than you can ask or even think. Number two, the Lord is your keeper. So have confidence in God's care. He will preserve you. He will preserve you. Have confidence in his care. Verse 3, would you look at verse 3 and on? And he says, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. When they are in trouble or struggling or some bad things happen to them, some Christians think that maybe this is happening to me. I'm going through this because God does not know about this. I mean, they don't want to take the route denying God's almighty power, thinking that, oh, God couldn't do anything about it. They don't want to do that. Nor they don't want to question God's goodness as if God is bad, evil, so... Often, some Christians, I find, they take this route and thinking, oh, maybe this is happening to me. I'm struggling with this and bad things are happening to me because he's, he does not know what I'm going through, really. He's not aware of the things happening in my life in detail. If you are trying to find comfort in that way, in that wrong theology, it will cause greater problems. Don't do that. God being unaware, as if there's a moment for an angel to come and, God, my holy Lord, just, just in case that you did not know, check this out. This is happening to him, to her. That the, never the case. That never happens. That God is not aware of something. God sees and knows completely, perfectly, exhaustively. He is fully aware of all things all the time. All things all the time. So this Psalter says, he does not sleep nor even slumber. Not even a single moment. He's like, oh, what happened? Not even a single thing is outside of his attention or his awareness. He does not take a nap. I'm so tired. I'm going to take a nap. Just, just let it run by itself. He does not do himself. Oh, what just happened? I just missed it. What was it? We do that. Not him. One time, when Dial, my son, was a little baby, before one, he couldn't even crawl. Right? It was just probably just maybe a little moving side by side. That time, you know. We used to, at the time, slept with our son, me and my wife, on the same king-size bed together. My wife and me, and in between, we put baby, and we slept all together. And at the time, some of my family members, they know that our bed was so high above my belly, right below my chest. Because we had this high drawer at the bottom, and the thick spring box, box spring, and then we had uh, this memory form thick mattress on top of it. So you put them all three together. We were living in an apartment, and we needed it, and we wanted some spaces, the storage spaces and drawers. So we got that, and I know we later we regret, regretted it, but that's how high it was. And, you know, uh, those of you who know my wife, my wife is kind of small, you know. So every day it was a challenge for her to literally climb up on the bed. Because it was so high for her, and later we had to get a stepper for her to get up there and to come down. That's how high it was, really. And one night we were all sleeping together, and middle of the night I heard boom and ah, yeah, baby crying. You can imagine. Both of us, we got up, and I mean, we truly put the baby in between us, and somehow. Towards the feet side, towards the bottom, the baby fell on that side and crying on the floor. 
we don't know what happened. We were sleeping. How baby he got there and fell, we have no idea. Um, but don't worry. I mean, as you can see him today, he's fine. He's fine. So either Dao's head is stronger than the floor, or someone was up all night long and watching over him. Even the parents, we fail because we sleep. Things get outside of our attention and awareness that never happens to God. The sun shall not strike you by day nor moon by night. Day or night, it does not matter. He keeps you all the time. And verse, last verse, it says, you're going out, you're coming in. He keeps you. Even the everyday little detailed things that you do or routine things you do. And going out, you're coming in, which means implies everywhere he keeps you. Be confident of his care. The Lord is your keeper. Normally in our world, when we think about keeper or guards, we tend to think that an uh, inferior protects a guard, a superior, such as you know, the soldiers guard the king or secret service agents, they protect the president and on and on. Right? But not in this case. He who is infinitely higher and glorious and greater than you one who deserves your worship and your full obedience claims to be, I am your guard. I will be your guard. I will be your keeper. I will watch over you. I will protect you. He calls himself, I am your helper. I am your keeper. In his holy word. He is always in this relationship. He is always giver to me. I am never a giver to him. What can I give to him that he does not have? He does not need anything from me. Always in this relationship, he is a giver. Always he is my helper, not the other way. I don't help him. Always he is my keeper. I do not keep him. Worship this great king who calls himself to be your helper and keeper. Lastly, here's my question. How would the early Christians, I was thinking, how would the early Christians would sing this passage and apply this passage to themselves when they were going through persecutions? I mean, the countless death of the faithful ones, believers, the children being put to death, thrown into the lion and torn apart, and their parents, their family, and the church members, one Sunday they say, hello, and the next day they, you find your friends and f- church members are being burned as a tor- human torches. And how can they sing this very song, saying, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night, the Lord will keep you. I mean, even till this day, so many Christians, we suffer, we get disease, we get injury, we get accident. Troubles in this life. And our Lord Jesus himself told us they expect that in this world you will have many tribulations. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said that some of you will be thrown into the prison and put to death for my name's sake. Be faithful till the end, till the death. And Peter in his letter says, do not be surprised when fiery trials come to you. Don't be surprised. <gasps> what? Happened? No, it will happen to you. So, with all those messages in the Bible and this Psalm 121, how do we put them together? What does this Psalm mean by then? Number three, He will keep your life. Verse seven, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. Now, think about that first part there. The Lord will keep you from all evil. I want you to understand this aspect first. Let me try to unpack that in this way. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 12, there is a story given to us in a symbolic way that there's a woman in the wilderness. And the woman symbolizes, signifies God's people, the believing community, both Old Testament and New Testament time. And there's a dragon, the devil, 
hates the woman. And the woman is pregnant, and the child is about to be born from the woman. The child represents the Messiah. The child is about to come out from the believing community. And the dragon is waiting for the child to be born. As soon as the child is born, the dragon is trying to devour, kill the child. child was born, but the child got cut up to the heaven. He ascended to the heaven, and the dragon couldn't do anything about it. And then he says there was a war happening in the heavenly realm. And the dragon and his angels and the archangel Michael and his angels had a war fight against each other and the dragon lost and got kicked off from the heaven into this world. And the dragon got furious, angry because he lost from the heaven and he knows that his time is short and he couldn't do anything about the child. So now the fury of the dragon, the anger is towards the woman who have given birth to the child. the believing community, the church. And the dragon is pouring out water like a flood to swallow her up. But God caused the earth to move and to open up, to drown all the water, and God keeps her, sustains her for three and a half years. Meaning, in the Revelation, you find 1,260 days, that number a lot. If you count one year as 360 days, that's three years and a half. The number seven is a full, complete number. If the whole history of the humanity, of the redemptive history is seven, that's the second half, the last days, meaning God will keep and protect the woman, believing community, till the end. The devil will not be able to destroy her. not be successful. The psalm is not only speaking to you individually, the psalm also speaks collectively as a corporate level, the church, God's community. The evil will not be able to overcome her. God will keep his people No matter what kind of persecution and schemes of devil come against her, the church, God's people, will not perish. So not only individual level, on the church. He will protect us. As Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He will protect his people till the end. But secondly, not only the collective level, but on the individual level, We need to understand this um, within the teaching of the entire scripture. Because this does not mean that Christian or Christian, a single you, does not mean that you won't face any trouble, any sickness, or any problem in this world. Obviously not. Other parts of the Bible made it clear to us. And you know that he will keep your life here in this passage does not mean Believers not going to die. Obviously, this author, one who wrote this song, knows that all the good, faithful believers of his past day, they all die. He knows that Abraham died and so and so and so. So he cannot mean, oh, God will keep you alive, means you will never die. That does not mean that. Then what does that mean that he will keep your life? Think about that. Notice how this psalm ends at the end. The Lord will keep his people going out, coming in. For how long? He will keep you for how long? From this time forward and forevermore. We die, but his keeping you will continue forevermore, eternally. So there is an eternal keeping aspect of life here. eternal protection here. John chapter 17, verse 12, Jesus said in his prayer to the Father, he says, while I was with them, Jesus is saying to the Father, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of the destruction, which is the Judas Iscariot. So they what? The scripture might be fulfilled. I kept them in your name. I guarded them. 
so not even single one of them will be lost. That's what our Lord Jesus said. He will not lose any one of his people whom the Father has given to him, but he will bring all of them to life, to the Father, to the eternal life. This psalm says, he will not let your foot be moved. You know what that means? Often in the Bible, remaining in one's faith, strong, is described as standing firm in the Lord. Standing firm. So the Bible often calls us, stand firm, stand firm. But foot being moved or slip is described as losing faith, losing confidence. He will not let your foot be moved. He will guard you, your faith, your life, so that you may not lose your faith and sleep. Just like that. When Peter's about the Peter's denial of Jesus, remember what Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, the Satan demanded to have you to shift you like wheat, but I prayed for you so that your faith may not fail. The only reason Peter did not lose his faith because Jesus Christ guarded him through his prayer. That's why you did not lose your faith. Father, I kept them. I have guarded them so that not one of them have been lost. No one will be able to snatch us out of his hand. If any one of you say, I'm so weak, I'm so fragile, I don't know. My love often goes cold very quickly. One day I say, passionate, yes, Lord, I will be obedient to you. And the following next day, I fail to obey you again. What if something really bad happened to me in the future, something I cannot handle, and really hard trials, and what if I lose my faith in the future? The call of the Bible is clear. Persevere, endure in trusting God, and He will preserve you. He will preserve you. He will not lose you. A couple months ago, my family, we went to some place and we came home together at night time. And those of you who've been in my house, you know this better. My house has a one narrow driveway right next to our house building. So we put our two big, you know, the trash bin inside in a part. And then we put the car in there and the other car back to back in, in one narrow way. So we went somewhere when we came home. And um, it was a trash empty day, so our trash bin was on the street. So we, I parked on the street, and my wife got out first to move the parked car back and to get those trash to be trash bin to put it inside, and she can park it back so I can park in you know, all of, at the very end. So I was waiting in the driver's seat by myself, and my son down got out first and went into the house, and my daughter, little one, Abigail, was sleeping in the back. So my wife got out, trying to move the car first, and in my car, I was watching her and trying to be a good husband. Instead of just sitting there and watching her doing all the work, I decided to go out and give her a hand and help her out, right? So I opened the car door, and then I stepped out, and... It felt weird. For that split second, I did not know. I, I, got, I was confused. Like, am I getting dizzy? Because I felt like the ground was moving, as if you were standing on the treadmill. So my one foot slipped. And quickly, I put the other foot. And then both of foot was slipped. And I did not understand what was going on. And I grabbed on the car door with my two hands, and I got dragged. I realized the moment, and I fell because it was dragging and scraped here, and then I couldn't hold on to it. I had to let go, and the car was moving. I thought I was put the car on the park, but I was just on the brake. And then I just looked at her. Oh, I'm just going to help her out and open the door. I just got out. And Abigail sleeping in the back, and the car was just moving forward accelerating faster and faster. And our house is on a curved side street. So if the car is going, keep going forward, 
the projection you can see is directly right into my neighbor's house wall. And it's going faster and faster going there. So I fell and it hurts, but for that moment, it does not matter how painful it is. I got up and as soon, I mean, as fast as I can run, I run to the car. I mean, you cannot stop the car with your hands. And you got to get in the car to stop the car. And it was not easy to get in the moving car to in the driver's seat with the handles and all. I tried to get in and it was running into that house and I managed to get in. I put, banged my knees here and there. I finally got to step on the brake and I stopped the car and the car stopped literally about like four feet away from hitting the wall of that neighbor's house. My neighbor has no idea. <laughs> and my daughter Abigail has no idea. She was sleeping in the back. I brought the car back, hurt, and my wife is like, where did you go? I was like, you have no idea what just happened to me. Whew. Why do I share that? Remember not too long ago, in my preaching, one of my preaching was about this, that Jesus, our worship leader, Jesus does not only receive our song, but Jesus sings with us. That Jesus actually, as our elder brother, as our representative, he leads our song. The crucified and risen Christ also sing this song, this song with us. In other words, what I'm saying is this. This is also his song. His song. Jesus came into this world to save us from the crashing course that we were heading quickly to the death, eternal death and destruction. And we weren't even aware of it. Like my daughter Abigail, just completely unaware of it. And he did not just do his best to help you, nor he just gave you some tips how to work it out, nor he did not just take some risk to protect you. He got crushed. He died to keep your life. To keep your life so that you may be forever eternally saved in the hand of God. He lost his life so that our lives may be kept forever. At least for those two days when Jesus was dead, in the eyes of the disciples, it seemed like the devil has won, the evil has won, and the Father did not protect him. This psalm did not apply to Jesus, at least to him. It seemed like, no. He says he will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. No, no, look at Jesus. But the Father kept his life and raised him up from the dead. And this reason and glorified Christ, this is his song. And he sings with us. And he sings this song to us. And he says, the Lord will keep you from evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out, your coming in from this time forth forevermore. He confidently says, the reason Christ says, the Lord my Father will keep you. I know it. So he shall be for us too in the future. On that day, no matter what we went through in this life, you will find yourself standing before your Father confidently, justified, forgiven, dressed in Christ's righteousness, gloriously, and being better than ever before in a better. And all the things, even if you had a cancer and all, and you will say, you kept me. It is well with my soul. The Lord kept me from all evil. The Lord kept my life. And the Lord will keep me, my going out and coming in from this time forth forevermore. This shall be our song forever. Let's pray together.